Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope now you can all hear me. Um, my name is Florence Behrman, and I'm the Head of Fundraising at TransAid. Um, good morning to those of you in the UK, and uh, good afternoon to those of you in Zambia, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to join us for this webinar on how TransAid is adapting to a COVID-19 uh, environment. Um, I'm delighted uh, that we have a range of speakers for you uh, this morning. Um, so from the UK, I have our uh, TransAid CEO, Caroline Barber, um, two members of our Mamas Against Malaria at Scale Project um, in Zambia are also joining us. So we have Dennis Simoyoni and Exilia Pirangondo, uh, who will talk about the challenges Zambia is currently facing. Um, and finally, Sam Clark, who's our Head of Programmes, joining us from Tanzania. Um, so I will now pass over to Caroline, who will give an introduction um, on how TransAid is adapting. Thank you ever so much, Florence. Um, as, as Florence mentioned, my name is Caroline Barber. I'm the Chief Executive um, at TransAid. I would also like to say thank you ever so much for taking the time to join us today um, for this webinar. We're really delighted to be joined by so many colleagues from around the world. Um, we've got 56 people joined so far, and I can see that number is rising. We've had over 90 people registered. Some are planning to listen again later who can't make it today. So we welcome colleagues from um, Uganda, from Zambia, from Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, and from Europe. A very, very warm welcome to you all. COVID-19 has brought unprecedented challenges from um, and I am sure that every single person on this call has been personally affected in one way or another. And it's in these times that it's more important than ever that we stand together. So I'm speaking to you today from my home in the UK. Um, we closed our London offices over a month ago to work from home um, in line with the UK government's directives on physical distancing measures. And I'm sure many of you on the call today are also joining from your homes. First and foremost, we need to keep um, people safe and to reduce the risk of transmission. Many events that TransAid was involved in has been delayed or, or even cancelled. And of course, that has had a knock-on effect in terms of our funding. As for many businesses and charities around the world, these are challenging times. But I am extremely proud of the way that the team at TransAid, our partners and all of our supporters have rallied together. And thank you so much for that support. As you know, most of TransAid's activities take place in sub-Saharan Africa. And currently, the number of cases is relatively low compared to what we're seeing in Europe and in the US. Many countries where TransAid works have ex considerable experience in managing infectious diseases and do currently manage a high burden, for example, of HIV and AIDS, malaria and TB. Valuable experience has also been drawn from the Ebola crisis where responses um, involving testing and tracing were employed. We've seen also that some African governments were far quicker to respond than the West. However, many countries in sub-Saharan Africa will face additional challenges if the numbers rise. Health systems in many countries where TransAid's working are already overstretched. We see that there are often few ICU beds and respiratory treatment devices we're also gravely concerned about the economic consequences in a context where many people will need to make difficult choices about whether to go out to work to feed their families or whether to stay home in efforts to try and keep them safe. Transe believes that every single community matters and we're doing our best to respond to this crisis with prevention, preparedness planning and building resilience. In each country, we are following the national guidelines and working hand in hand with the Ministry of Health to adapt to an evolving situation. I've been on a call this morning with our colleagues in Madagascar as we prepare for the arrival of a container of bicycles on the 14th of May and trying to navigate through and plan the best way to ensure those activities are safe and are not adversely um, affected. In Zambia, many of you on this call know about the Mammoth Scale program that's been implemented by TransAid, Development Data, Die Global Health, Disacare, and in partnership with the National Malaria Elimination Programme. Our corporate partners, of whom I can see many have joined on the call today, 
have been unbelievably supportive of this programme and over the last two years your efforts have helped us to scale up our vital malaria work. So it will come to as no surprise to many of you, um, especially those of you who travelled to Zambia and had the privilege to meet the team working on the ground, that the team has got straight to work to integrate a COVID-19 response and we'll be sharing more about this with you today. You can see um, in this slide community health volunteers who are busy providing health services to their communities every single day. The emergency transport scheme or the ETS riders were also among the first to step forward and we've been training over 180 riders in the last week um, to adapt to new ways of working necessitated by the context of COVID-19. And you will be hearing more on this from my colleagues Auxilia and Dennis. So I really just want to take the chance to thank you all for your unwavering support and really your humbling generosity. This has allowed us to continue our work. It is so important that we don't lose ground in this fight against severe malaria, maternal mortality and indeed road crashes. You've also enabled us to incorporate a really practical COVID-19 response into our work and in just the space of a few short weeks we put that to work. I want to make a very special mention to the FIA Foundation who have joined us today for the call. We're extremely grateful for your support and your confidence in us. Globally, the pandemic has highlighted just how vital transport and logistics industry is to all of our daily lives. Warehouses are still operating, trucks are still moving, and amazing people like Rebecca, the ETS rider in this photo here, are still providing the life-saving services to their communities. It is critical that these services do not stop and the work continues. Thank you so much for your time. I'll now hand over to my colleague, um, Auxilia Perigando. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Sorry, my, my uh, mic was on mute. Uh, thank you, Carol, for the introductions. Uh, my name is Auxilia Pringondo. I'm the donor liaison officer for the Mamas Against Malaria at Scale project. I'm also the director for development data uh, in Zambia. Uh, currently, the situation in Zambia, um, as of uh, this morning statistics uh, for the 4th of May, we have uh, 137 confirmed cases of COVID-19, 56 active cases, three deaths, and uh, 78 uh, recoveries. Recoveries. The measures that have been introduced by the government of Zambia. Um, a COVID contingency plan has been finalized on the 24th of March and it continues to be regularly updated as the outbreak continues to evolve. The Ministry of Health has also pledged that they will continue to provide essential and uh, routine, routine healthcare services. These include maternal health and also vaccinations are continuing. The, uh, the Ministry of Health has set up an epidemic uh, preparedness fund under the Ministry of Health, which, is, which amounts to 57 million kwacha, which is equivalent to about uh, 3.1 million US dollars. The public safety measures implemented include closure of schools, higher learning uh, institutions, wearing masks in uh, public places, and um, they've also uh, informed uh, like shops. You cannot go to any shops without wearing masks. And there's been a restriction of uh, public gatherings, restaurants to operate only on takeaway and delivery basis, screening of uh, travelers into Zambia. The government has also directed that um, 
the infection and prevention control measures in health facilities uh, must be reinforced. As Carol mentioned earlier, travelers into Zambia, uh, there is monitoring for all the travelers who are coming into Zambia, and they've been uh, isolated, I, the, they'll be isolated at designated government facilities while awaiting test results. Efforts to rapidly detect any cases have also been heightened through surveillance around the country at community levels, health facilities, points of entries, and uh, sentinel sites. Contract tracing, monitoring of persons under quarantine and adherence, verification and follow-up of alerts uh, is also in progress. Radio spots have been booked until uh, July 2020, and my colleague Dennis will elaborate more on uh, what mamas are doing regarding the uh, communication through the radio channels. There have been challenges. Everybody, it's, uh, COVID-19 is new for everybody, and uh, it's a challenge, especially in uh, low-resourced countries like Zambia. And in the communities, social distancing is almost not possible due to the nature of housing. And there's been uh, so substantial economic losses for all traders, especially the informal sector. Zambia largely relies on, uh, on the informal sector. So most of, uh, the pro most of the communities also buy their goods from the informal sectors. There has been an increase in un unemployment rates some companies have already closed, some businesses have shut down, they have retrenched people, and uh, there's reduced demand for commodities, especially in the informal sector. There's also increased anxiety and other mental health conditions. People are not sure about what exactly uh, happens when somebody gets uh, COVID-19. So that results in anxiety. And, um, lack of adequate knowledge in the communities on how the virus is spread. Uh, people are getting messages from uh, all sorts of channels, thereby that increase, increases anxiety as well. And there's uh, reduced social in, uh, interaction, is uh, people have been told to stay at home. Although Zambia is not really shut down, it's not on lockdown, but we've just been told to stay indoors. And the basic prices for foodstuffs is also risen. Uh, however, the positive side of uh, COVID-19 is that there is increase in hygiene. Um, the washing of hands and uh, cleaning surfaces, it may also reduce at other waterborne diseases such as cholera. And uh, Zambia has been known for high cholera rates as well. But now people are a bit conscious about cleanliness. Uh, the cost of mask, masks cannot go unmentioned, uh, considering that uh, many people cannot afford basic commodities like food, uh, seeking help. Um, therefore, the, uh, for them to afford masks, it's a bit of a challenge. And water as well. There are some areas that do not have water, especially in the rural areas. They have to walk long distances to fetch water and ask, asking them to frequently wash their hands becomes a challenge. And uh, soap as well is also a challenge. The cost of soap is also increased and sanitizers is a challenge for most of the people in Zambia. Uh, Zambia has a population of uh, 17, 17 million. And um, unfortunately we only have eight functional ventilators which will, uh, if, if uh, the, the rates go up, it will be really unfortunate since we only have eight ventilators. And then we have only 20 ICU beds. And then uh, social distancing, as I mentioned earlier, due to the nature of housing in most uh, communities in Zambia, the measures are really challenging to enforce. And also most people use public transport and uh, the buses will be crowded, the public transport uh, where they get the buses from will also be uh, a challenge. And it's also difficult for most people to work from home, considering we have electricity problems. So people can't also go to restaurants 
if they want to charge their laptops as well. So it's difficult to work from home. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, many people need work, work to live. They actually rely on what they, on the income they get on a daily basis. And if they can't go out to work, it means their income has been reduced. Uh, as my colleague Carol mentioned earlier, uh, we are very grateful to FIA Foundation that their grantees come at the right time and we are very thankful and we know it will go a long way in helping us manage COVID-19 in Zambia. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll pass on the button stick to my colleague, Denise Simeone, who will explain what, what we are doing as mamas ex, uh, at scale in the districts. Thank you. Over to you, Dennis. Thank you very much, Oxiria. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Yeah, my name is Dennis Simuyuni. Uh, I'm the operations manager for Mamas Against Marelia at Scale Project. Um, I sorry, I, I want so I want the next slide. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. So um. We in Zambia, like any other country in the world, has been surprised by the coronavirus, which has hit us all. Uh, and um, as a result, um, the government, through the Ministry of Health, um, you know, had to come up with uh, uh, guidelines on uh, how we are going to intervene by the use of uh, community health volunteers across the country. So uh, the ministry tasked the Zambia National Public Health Institute to come up with uh, uh, standards and guidelines on how we are going to intervene uh, by, you know, the, you know, employing the use of, uh, I mean, uh, using the community health volunteers who are very, very critical in the delivery of primary health care system at community level. Yeah. So Mamas Against Marelia, um, you know, Mamas Against Malaria scale has uh, a very, very strong uh, community, you know, uh, presence and experience. We have been uh, working at community levels with uh, community health volunteers for over 10 years. We have a network of over 2,000 community health volunteers uh, in Serenje and the, uh, Chitambo alone. So, uh, based on this, our voice was very, very critical and very cardinal in the development of these guidelines. We provided um, our experience to the team uh, that was, uh, you know, looking at the development of guidelines. And, uh, you know, these guidelines are what are going to be guiding the country on how we are going to be intervening so that uh, uh, our procedures are standard. We are working with uh, different uh, district health management teams in, uh, in, in our interventions uh, in our rural areas. And we have been working on, um, we have been working with district health management team in delivering our intervention on maternal health uh, front and also malaria fronts. Um, because of COVID-19, uh, like everyone else, any other organization, we have been affected and uh, our program uh, has been affected in the sense that we cannot go on carrying on business as usual. Hence, there was need for us to come up with uh, strategies and the interventions so that we could incorporate uh, both uh, our malaria activities and uh, and um, and uh, COVID activities. Um, what we did was uh, we oriented our community health volunteers, our lead community health volunteers, to be able to respond positively to the uh, 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 to the um, issues of COVID. So what we did is we coached them in awareness raising and campaign uh, raising so that uh, you know, we could uh, you know, add our voice and be able to uh, assist in the, in the fight. Yeah, so, sorry, I'm just a uh, slide. Okay, so we, sorry Florence, I can't see the slides.
Okay, so we came up with uh, a different range of uh, interventions and uh, we built on what was already existing, which are the food banks and uh, which we have been putting, which are uh, in, in the communities, which are, we are using to build the resi uh, resilience uh, because we are very sure that at some point uh, these uh, issues of COVID-19 will hit the communities very hard. So uh, we have uh, decided uh, using the funds that have been provided to us to put in place some food banks to top up on the food banks and also procure certain um, um, uh, items and materials that are going to be used in the fight. So we have procured homemade um, uh, masks which are going to be used by the community volunteers in the communities. We have procured soap which is going to be helpful uh, in terms of keeping hygiene and we have also encouraged the community of volunteers through coaching uh, to be able to observe social uh, uh, distancing by uh, you know um, giving them what is uh, the government has uh, prescribed as uh, the best uh, you know distance between people while they are carrying their uh, activities uh, in consultation with the district health team we have come up with uh, ways of uh, making sure that our strategies are well designed to be able to reach different parts of the communities for example Within our areas that we are operating from, there are areas which need different interventions in terms of how you relay the messages. We are, we are operating in rural Zambia and certain areas in rural Zambia do not have communication access. So we are, we are you know, providing different kinds of intervention. For example, in those areas where there is no communi uh, communication, network, we are using PA system to be able to reach those communities so that uh, we could uh, broadcast the uh, messages, awareness messages on COVID-19. We are also using radio, community radio, uh, to broadcast messages uh, to the community. We are also employing radio drama to be able to relay our messages effectively. We are also using uh, SMS messaging where there is a, a, a network and we are also um, putting uh, uh, posters. Uh, we are sticking posters in strategic community uh, areas uh, where um, you know community members are able to you know to read these messages and these messages are translated in uh, local language. Um, going forward uh, we are going to see uh you know the fact that now we are going into the, the, the cold season in zambia we are getting into the cold season in zambia we are likely to see that uh, the uh, cases of covid 19 will raise so as a result we have made sure that our volunteers are well prepared to be able to respond uh the volunteers um have been oriented and they are aware of how to respond uh, in terms of uh, 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 COVID or malaria. So um, we have equipped them with uh, different kinds of uh, equipment, including the bicycle ambulances, which are a, a, a community-based mode of transport based at community level. These ambulances are a robust kind of uh, equipment, which is uh, you know, suited and well designed to be able to uh, provide uh, the local communities with uh, transport, uh, images transport system. So these are usually designed in the, uh, in the way that uh, they are pieces of equipment that conform to the environment uh, they are the culture of the, the, the area where they are going to be operated. For example, in Serenji and Chitambo, bicycle ambulances, bicycles are a you know, primary mode of transport. So these pieces of equipment are made in such a way that uh, you know, the local communities are able to you know, use them and also to you know, do, uh, 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 do uh, maintenance works on them. So they are very cheap and very easy to, to use. This fight uh, of uh, COVID um, will continue um, and uh, we are very, very grateful to, to FIA for providing this, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, these funds for us to continue.
even in the face of COVID-19, our fight against malaria must continue so that we don't uh, 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 lose the positive gains that we have achieved so far. In consultation with National Malaria uh, National uh, uh, Malaria Elimination Center, uh, CHVs have been uh, advised to continue with their work, but they need to observe social distance and employ the extra hygiene measures, uh, which are hand washing and uh, putting on of gloves at uh, you know uh, times when they need to examine patients. Uh, CHVs uh, trend on uh, similarities of. Uh, COVID-19 and malaria, because if you, uh, you, you uh, CHVs are not properly coached, they may mistake uh, the, you know, the signs which are similar of fever to COVID-19 when in the actual sense they could be malaria. So we have made sure that the community of volunteers are trained to be able to make a proper diagnosis, uh, a diagnosis, a diagnosis uh, in order not to mix up the two. So uh, this is in, uh, in line with uh, uh, what the ministry has been uh, you know, uh, 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 advocating. We also have experience uh, from our neighbor in Congo where they had uh, an outbreak of Ebola. Uh, but because the country was so overwhelmed, the Ministry of Health was so overwhelmed there, they paid too much attention on uh, on uh, fighting uh, Ebola and leaving these other diseases to terrorize the community. So we are alive to the fact that, uh, you know, uh, apart from COVID, there are other uh, diseases like malaria that will continue going on. So we have prepared to make sure that even in the face of this, we should be able to respond positively. Our community health volunteers, um, um, as coached, uh, are advised to continue the administration of rectal artisanate um, suppositories, which is RAS, which is a peripheral drug uh, which is administered at community level uh, uh, to children uh, between the ages of six months and uh, uh, six years. So we you know, trained the community volunteers uh, on the danger signs. They are able to recognize the danger signs and uh, uh, they are able to administer the, the, the prescribed drug um, correctly. So retroactisonate is uh, basically a peripheral drug uh, and the you know, uh, community volunteers who administer it at community level and they refer the patients to the health facility to go and complete the, uh, uh, the treatment with the WHO uh, uh, recommended drug, which is uh, uh, injectable artisanate. We did pilot uh, the use of uh, 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 rectal artisanate, which was in our pilot project between 2017 and the 2018, in July. So the results that came up were very amazing. Uh, we were able to reduce the fatality, uh, severe malaria case fatality from 8% at baseline to about 0 0.5 at uh, the end of the, uh, the, the, the project. So this drug has really proven to be something that uh, has really helped our country to, you know, to fight uh, malaria very, very effectively. And based on that, uh, we have presented this information to the government and the government is at the moment uh, 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 taking it as policy and the pro procuring now uh, rectal artisanate uh, uh, for use uh, in all health facilities. So I'm going to just give you uh, one of uh, our case studies, uh, which is about a, a young girl um, aged th three. Uh, the name of this girl is maybe Skunda. So in, 20, in May 2018, during our pilot project, uh, Priscilla, the mother to the child, Mary Kunda, um, um, you know, had seen that uh, the child was uh, showing signs of being unwell and uh, presented, um, you know, a, a high fever. And she, the baby was failing to eat. Uh, she later on in the, mid, uh, in, the, in the morning developed uh, convulsions. So the mother was quick to go and uh, visit one of our community health volunteers who are trained to actually uh, look at uh, um, this, uh, you know, to actually advise the mother on uh, what is supposed to be done next. 
So maybe it was rushed after the community of volunteer, you know, looked at the child and realized that this child had severe malaria. They, you know, administered uh, two suppositories of retroatisonate uh, on the child and also did another DT and another DT came out positive. So the child was rushed to the uh, facility, which is the uh, Mulilima, uh, which is in, uh, in Serenje. And uh, uh, using the community volunteer that was uh, 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 nearby, and they called uh, the, the, the rider to rush the child to, to, the, to the facility using the bicycle ambulances. So the child was um, admitted there, and the first dose, second and third dose of the uh, injected bartisonate was were administered on the child. And the following day, the child was feeling much better. And at eight hours, the child was discharged. And uh, based on this, the mother was very, very happy and thanked the project and the Minister of Health for the interventions. We are very sure that, uh, you know, um, this is just one of those uh, cases that uh, are going to come out from this intervention that FI has given to us. Therefore, we are just uh, very thankful for FIA for providing the project with these funds so that, uh, uh, you know, these, you know, stories that we, you know, like this one for Memphis will be uh, 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 stories that will be heard um, in future and people, a lot of people will benefit from, uh, you know, this kind of uh, intervention. So based on this, I want to, uh, you know, thank everyone for, you know, uh, paying attention to, you know, my presentation and I would want to just to hand over my uh, the, the mentor now to you know um, Sam Clark. Sam. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sam Clark. I'm the head of programs for Transaid. <laughs> um, I plan to tell you a little bit about the current status of our road safety program today what we're seeing on the ground, how we think we can incorporate a COVID-19 response to this particular program. Um, I should make it clear at this point that this proposed COVID-19 response currently constitutes advanced discussions, so we're, we're currently seeking funding to implement it. Many of you already know how our road safety program works. It's an approach which works through our local partners, uh, which are our primary ones, Safeway Right Way, the Industrial Training Center, and the National Institute of Transport. Uh, we develop improved professional driver training standards, influence their adoption at a national or regional level, um, and build local capacity to, to deliver the training aligned with these standards. Understandably, COVID-19 has uh, presented a challenge to ours and our partners' training. Uh, restrictions on mass gatherings are obviously in place in many of the countries where we're working. Um, and at this point in time, training activities are minimal, but there's still a lot to do in the meantime. While we feel it's a responsible thing to do to adapt the program to ensure we contribute positively to COVID-19, uh, we also think it's essential to maintain our focus on road safety during these challenging times. So, here are some of the reasons why, actually. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, we've seen a significant reduction in the use of public and private transport on the roads. Uh, the East African community are reporting a 50% reduction in the use of public transport in the region. Uh, in countries like Uganda, which has taken a much harder stance than most to restricting movement, there's um, actually pretty much no public transport available at this time. Evidence suggests that air quality is improving um, and that there are fewer road traffic crashes um, on the roads. <clears throat> However, our concerns are that these conditions, while they've contributed to a reduction in road traffic crashes is, may, may lead to an increase in the severity of each crash. We're therefore asking ourselves many questions uh, for which, unfortunately, there is no data at present to answer. But, for example, 
are fewer vehicles on the road leading to vehicles traveling at higher speeds? Are the restrictions on the number of people in HGV cabs and the bans on drivers using hotels leading to fewer rest stops and, and in turn increased fatigue? And also, how are drivers able to, pra uh, to practice social distancing at borders which have become hubs for hundreds, in some cases, thousands of drivers undergoing testing? These are a few of the pictures um, at some border crossings in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in recent days. As you can see, there's uh, increased visibility, quite substantially, of, of truck drivers at the borders with queues reaching back for many kilometers, all of which have brought drivers significantly more attention um, in recent weeks. So, I don't know if you guys uh, look at Twitter much, but if you look there, you'll see that many of the drivers in the US and Europe Europe are being applauded for the important role that they're playing in in keeping supply chains functioning. Um, however, there's evidence of increased hostility towards drivers in sub-Saharan Africa, which is evident on, on many, of, many of the social media platforms, Twitter, for example, and, and many more, Instagram, etc. So let's take Uganda as an example. We can see where this hostility is coming from. Um, basically, the tough stance on, on restricting movement in, in that country appears to be, to some extent, controlling the number of new cases of COVID-19. But actually, a large proportion of those currently being tested positive have been truck drivers coming into the country. Um, and really, for this reason, there's been a lot of inf uh, a lot of opposition to them on social media, um, and obviously a potential threat to their safety on the ground. Governments are now starting to respond to the situation. Uh, they're trying to flatten the curve and uh, address some of the threats of drivers transmitting the virus uh, along the routes that they use. Uh, while this action has been a little slow, a little bit slow off the mark, um, we're seeing actions such as the introduction of relay driving in East Africa, whereby trucks are handed over, or rather the freight on the truck is handed over at the border to other drivers. So, for example, truck drivers uh, driving to Uganda from Kenya uh, will, in the coming days slash weeks, be asked to hand over their freight to Ugandan drivers at the border to continue the journey onwards to the destination. We've also seen the introduction of fines as a measure of enforcing social distancing. Um, and we've also seen several different testing regimes put in place at border crossings. <clears throat> so, as you'd expect, we've been talking to our partners on the ground, um, trying to gather an overall picture. Um, and generally, uh, the picture shows that access to, to basic personal protective equipment or PPE um, and awareness, re awareness raising materials specifically targeting drivers is limited. There are understandable challenges to overcome here with the guidelines. <clears throat> obviously, many of them are changing on a daily basis. Um, and obviously, drivers aren't always the easiest group to, to communicate with. They're, they're often away from home for, for days or weeks at a time. Small and medium-sized enterprises or, or SMEs are probably going to be the worst hit um, and the least able to adapt to many of the changes taking place. They'll find it difficult to comply with many of the new guidelines um, being introduced as you'd expect due to a limited, uh, limited resources at hand. Um, and there will also be a definite lack of capacity to cope with the relay handovers that are due to be introduced at border crossings, as mentioned. Um, SME drivers in particular are likely to find themselves marooned at border crossings in potentially hostile environments, but specifically with the relay handover mechanism that, that they're thinking of implementing. Um, also, partners on the ground who we've been speaking to have had uh, limited access to funds to respond adequately to the pandemic. So, this is how we plan to support. Um, our vision 
if you like, is to work with local partners uh, to address some of these shortcomings. We've managed to mobilize a team which is ready to respond quickly on the ground. Uh, that team includes local civil society organizations, transporter associations, and local government. Um, and together, we would like to develop up-to-date, accurate driver-specific materials, as well as locally sourced reusable PPE for distribution to drivers at rest stops and border posts. With transporter associations and district health teams, we want to make sure drivers have, have been regularly sensitized at driver hubs. Um, and that is, and that this sensitization reflects the rapidly changing guidelines and advice, which is, as I mentioned, changing on a daily basis in some cases. Finally, we develop key road safety messaging materials, uh, which are appropriate to context. And also we would share these with employers and with drivers themselves. So basically time is obviously of the essence here. Thankfully, the team are ready to go. So the next step for us is uh, to start approaching donors, uh, which we intend to do over the next few days to try and put this into action and to start implementation. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Florence Behrman. Uh, hopefully uh, you will now be able to hear me. Um, so as my uh, colleague Elena um, has put in the chat, please do feel free to ask any questions uh, that have come up on the back of those presentations. To start with, um, I want to ask a question to Caroline um, around um, the, in some places, um, in Senegal, for example, they've been trialling the use of malaria drugs to uh, to treat, combat COVID-19. Um, would you be able to give us your thoughts on, um, on that and what you think the dangers of that may be? Thanks ever so much, Florence. Um, I think that's a really timely question. Um, first and foremost, I think, you know, as, as a programme um, and as a team, the early malaria trials um, have, have not really been conclusive. So we need to exercise extreme caution and really follow the WHO guidelines. Um, we're also very concerned, we see that the malaria community is very concerned about taking essential life-saving malaria treatment and drugs out of the supply chain for malaria and redirecting them where we're seeing some people stockpiling elsewhere um, in case they might be useful later on. So I think there was some early thought that chloroquine could be useful um, and people were looking at that as a possible treatment. So the main message from us is until um, clinical trials show evidence of promising results, then we need to follow WHO guidelines and keep malaria drugs going where they're intended. Thanks very much. Thank you, Caroline. Um, Dennis, I wondered if you could give us an idea of how much some of these interventions you spoke about are costing. So things like the tippy, ta uh, the tippy taps, for example, um, or gloves. Um, these are very uh, low cost solutions. Is, is that right? Yes, uh, Florence, thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, the tippy taps, um, you know, for example, are very simple pieces of equipment and, uh, you know, costly, costing just uh, a few pounds. Uh, but they are, you know, going a long way in helping the communities to, you know, keep up with hygiene and um, also be able to, you know, uh, 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 keep the uh, washing uh, equipment uh, handy. So, you know, things like gloves also, they are, it's, it's only that, as my, uh, my colleague Oxiri has put it, uh, they have become too expensive now, gloves, but uh, we, uh, you know, we, you know, we have, um, you know, managed to get a few uh, to distribute in the areas where we are working. Uh, we have also managed to get uh, some homemade, uh, you know, uh, masks, which are really helping our community health volunteers to, you know, 
uh, protect themselves and the communities in where they are working. So really these, um, you know, small items um, are, are, are costing very less, but uh, they are going a long way in actually helping uh, the fight against COVID. I, I'm sorry I could not give figures because I have to calculate now. I realize that we have been, you know, people coming from different countries. So yeah, if I give pounds and, uh, you know, it's just, but uh, the best, all I can say is that uh, they are costing just a few, you know, uh, pounds. Uh, if I was just to get a standard of pounds, for example, maybe um, you know one one uh, one um, you know tippy uh, 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 tippy tap may cost maybe even two pounds to you know to 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 you know to to you know to to put in place in the community. So really, um, you know, they are costing less, but are uh, doing a lot of uh, work in terms of saving people, uh, the communities. Thank you, Dennis. Um, and Sam, um, you're based in Tanzania um, and actually on Zanzibar. Perhaps you could just give us a quick overview of what the situation is like for you there at the moment. Uh, yeah, the, I think many people would have seen uh, the news recently. Um, compared to places like Uganda, which, as I mentioned in my presentation, have taken a harder stance than most, um, Tanzania has not implemented any lockdowns uh, a lot of the public sort of facilities hotels restaurants and so forth are, are closed but there is no uh, enforced lockdown at the moment uh, there doesn't look like being one um, I know that to some extent uh, it's still to be believed or, or news items would lead you to believe that uh, some people in Tanzania aren't really believing in the potential impact in coronavirus yet. So I think there's still some way to go before uh, it's properly taken seriously. The numbers are uh, triple or even more what they are in Uganda. So Uganda, I, I, the last time I looked in Uganda, we were below uh, 100 cases. We're, we're up more in Tanzania, more in the mid 300s, um, late 300s. Um, but personally, on a on a personal note, we've we've just been staying close to home for the last four weeks when you guys in in the UK sort of uh, locked down and just yeah going out for essential needs. But thankfully, um, as we've said throughout the presentation, we're we're still very much able to support the programmes remotely, which is uh, which is great news. Thank you, Sam. Um, well, thank you again to everyone who has joined us uh, today. I hope you found that useful and informative. Um, and thank you to our panellists uh, for giving your thoughts um, on how Transaid is adapting to a COVID-19 world. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, please all stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.